I'm sure you've probably all seen the sport in some form or another. Bubble ball soccer. Yeah, I'd be up for trying it. Premise is straightforward. While the objective is supposed to be putting the ball in the net, everyone's just looking to decimate their opponents with cross checks that make hockey look like a joke. And of course, with the protective bubble wrapping, your body is more or less protected. A similar design has developed for the protective layers encasing the brain and spinal cord, and is the main topic of today's final session on the meninges. Welcome back to the final session for today's lesson. In the second lecture, we talked about the protection afforded to the spinal cord by the vertebral column. That's only half the story, however. Think about any time you've purchased something fragile, especially online. Sure, it comes in a box that protects it from being bashed around, but inside the box, the item is surrounded with styrofoam or bubble wrap to keep it from banging around. Same thing is seen with the spinal cord. The vertebral column provides this outer shell of protection, but we also need an inner wrapping of soft tissue to protect this delicate neural structure. This is the role of the spinal meninges. Our main objectives for this session will be to describe the morphology of the meningeal layers, but we'll also take a minute to describe the vascular supply to the spinal cord and explain a phenomenon that you'll be seeing over and over again throughout the body, namely collateral circulation. The spinal cord is wrapped in three coverings collectively known as the spinal meninges, a Greek term meaning membrane. You're probably familiar with the prefix of the word due to the fairly well-known medical condition known as meningitis or meningeal inflammation. Due to their close association with the brain and spinal cord, you can probably appreciate why this condition is so serious. There are three separate layers to the meninges, each referred to as mater, which is Latin for mother, reflecting the nurturing protection they provide the delicate neural tissue beneath. The outermost layer is the dura mater, or hard mother. It's made up of tough, fibrous connective tissue, forming a loose sac around the spinal cord. Just deep to the dura mater is the arachnoid mater, or spider mother. It's a thin, shiny, and translucent sheet that resembles saran wrap in appearance. Although not directly connected, the arachnoid mater lies immediately deep and flat against the dura mater. This is because of a positive pressure that exists in the region immediately deep to the arachnoid mater, appropriately named the subarachnoid space. This is due to the brain's consistent production of cerebral spinal fluid, which enters the vertebral canal between the arachnoid mater and the spinal cord, forcing it flat against the dura. The subarachnoid space is further reinforced by microscopic extensions coming off the arachnoid mater to anchor it to the spinal cord, known as arachnoid trabeculae. To the early anatomists, these extensions resembled spider webs, which is how the arachnoid mater earned its name. Because of their intimate relationship, the dura and arachnoid mater are often collectively referred to as the dural sac. The dural sac protects towards each of the spinal nerves, ultimately fusing with the epineurium connective tissue around the nerve, which eliminates the subarachnoid space. Think of a sweatshirt with elastic sleeves, and you'll sort of understand what I'm describing. The early anatomists must have been thinking along the same lines as they came to name these extensions the dural sleeves. The pia mater, or soft mother, makes up the third of the meningeal layers. It is directly adherent to the brain and spinal cord, providing delicate protection to the underlying neural tissue. Throughout its length, the pia mater projects bilaterally from the spinal cord, creating a periodic anchor with the dural sac in between spinal nerve projections. Because of this jagged tooth-like appearance, these projections are referred to as the denticulate ligaments. Here's how I like to describe the meningeal coverings. Think of a pair of felt-lined cargo pants. I know, it sounds a little strange, but bear with me here. The outer shell is like a dura mater. Imagine someone in cargo pants going through a forested area with branches scraping at their legs. They shouldn't get any scratches on their legs because of the protection that the pants provide. Same thing with the human body. The dura mater takes the blunt of any external friction to protect the spinal cord from abrasions. That inner felt lining that I mentioned, this is like the arachnoid mater. It's a separate layer from the outer shell of the cargo pant, but is more comfortable when contacting the skin. Same thing in the body. 
The membranous arachnoid mater would create minimal friction should it contact the spinal cord. Now the pia mater, think of the most comfortable pair of socks you ever owned the day you first took them out of the package and put them on. You can really think of them as like a pair of leggings, for example, where the material is pretty soft and in direct contact with the whole surface of the legs and the feet. Same idea for the pia mater. It's a protective membranous layer that lines the upper surface of the whole brain and spinal cord. It's also adherent, so in the lab, don't try lifting this layer. You'll damage the cord if you do. This describes the general structure of the meningeal coverings of the cord in the cervical and thoracic regions. But if you remember back to our discussion of embryological development, disproportionate growth between the bone and spinal cord means that the spinal cord terminates in the upper lumbar region. The meningeal coverings, on the other hand, are anchored to the coccygeal vertebrae and project the length of the vertebral column. A few minutes ago, I compared the Pia Mater to a very comfortable pair of socks. If you think back to when you were a kid, you probably had the experience of making the mistake of trying to take a sock off by pulling at the end of the toe, and it got stuck partway on, dangling off the end of your foot. Same sort of concept can be applied to the Pia Mater and the spinal cord. As the vertebral column grows, the coccygeal vertebrae will stretch the Pia Mater off the tip of the spinal cord, resulting in this elongation of the meningeal covering that we call the peel portion of the phylum terminale. The dura and arachnoid matter also project off the end of the spinal cord. The subarachnoid space remains patent until we reach the level of S2, at which point the dural sac converges on the phylum terminal. Think about taking a clear plastic bag and closing it off over top of a stick which protrudes at the bottom. This portion of the bag containing air and the stick would be analogous to the continuation of the subarachnoid space. In the body, we call this region the lumbar cistern, which is filled with cerebral spinal fluid, the cauda equina, and of course the phylum terminale, which is represented by the stick. The point at which the bag converges on the stick would be analogous to the convergence of the dura and arachnoid matter on the peel portion of the phylum terminale. At this point they fuse, the subarachnoid space is discontinued, and the three meningeal layers continue down as the dural portion of the phylum terminale. This is the portion that is anchored to the coccyx. Here is a schematic representation of the arrangement and cross-section within the thoracic region. Here we see the spinal cord resting in the subarachnoid space, surrounded by the dural sac, shown here in blue, with the arachnoid trabeculae projecting down to the surface of the cord. Outside of the dural sac is the epidural space, made up of fatty connective tissue for additional cushion and support. Note that the cross-sectional image changes as we move down the vertebral column. On the left is a cross-section through the mid-thoracic region. Again, we see the spinal cord and associated meningeal structures. On the right is a cross-section through the upper lumbar region. Note the absence of the spinal cord and the numerous spots within the subarachnoid space, which represent a cross-section within the cauda equina. The dural sac is an important boundary of clinical importance. An epidural which is most commonly associated with labor and delivery, involves the administration of anesthetic through a needle pass between the lumbar vertebrae and into the epidural space. When performing this procedure, the physician must be careful not to puncture the dural sac, which would introduce anesthetic into the subarachnoid space. Now, anesthetic can be introduced here. It's a procedure known as a spinal anesthetic, but the procedure requires a much smaller gauge of needle to avoid tearing of the dural sac and leaking of cerebral spinal fluid, which would cause sagging of neural tissue in the central nervous system and a complication known as post-dural puncture headache. People experience a similar sort of pain presentation with acute dehydration of the cerebral spinal fluid following a night of binge drinking, which is commonly referred to as a hangover. In addition, the total volume of anesthetic used during a spinal is far less than with an epidural. A misplaced epidural needle could therefore lead to overdose complications. The most common reason for introducing a needle into the subarachnoid space is not to introduce anesthetic, but to extract a sample of cerebral spinal fluid in a procedure called a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. The extracted fluid can be tested for a number of medical conditions, including viral or bacterial meningitis, as well as multiple sclerosis. Note that even in the case of a spinal anesthetic or spinal tap, there is no threat to the spinal cord. 
These procedures are performed in the lower lumbar region, primarily between the L4 and L5 vertebrae, whereas the spinal cord typically ends at the level of L1 or L2. There is slightly elevated risk with young children. Consequently, an epidural can be introduced caudally through the sacral hiatus. Last topic that we need to discuss today is the vascular supply to the spinal cord. A number of arteries supply the spinal cord and form interconnections known as anastomoses with one another. This reflects the vital importance of an uninterrupted blood supply to the neural tissues that they are so dependent on a consistent supply of oxygen. Even very small interruptions could result in functional deficits or neural death. Most of the vessels supplying the spinal cord arise segmentally from the aorta. The thoracic aorta, for example, gives off left and right intercostal arteries that project dorsally then laterally, traveling with the ribs. As they pass laterally to the intervertebral foramen, they give off posterior intercostal branches, which in turn give off spinal branches that travel medially along the spinal nerves through the intervertebral foramen. From here, they divide into anterior and posterior branches that follow the ventral and dorsal nerve roots, respectively. Smaller branches, referred to as radicular arteries, do not typically anastomose, but supply blood to a small focal area. Larger branches, referred to as segmental arteries, anastomose with one of three large arteries that run vertically along the spinal cord. A single anterior spinal artery and paired bilateral posterior spinal arteries. Let's take a look using a 3D perspective. Again, we have these spinal branches which divide into anterior and posterior segmental branches. This gives rise to the single anterior and two posterior spinal arteries, which then run the length of the cord. At each level, these arteries anastomose with segmental branches at additional cord levels. In the previous session, I described the spinal cord as being like a high-rise apartment building. Well, you can think of these three vertical arteries as being elevator lifts moving between the floors. This arrangement allows for sufficient vascular supply to the cord. Even in instances when a spinal branch becomes occluded, blood can still reach the occluded region using the anterior and posterior arterial branches. The major exception to this rule is the major segmental medullary artery, commonly referred to as the artery of Adamkowitz for the physician who first identified it, which usually comes off of the left side of the aorta between T8 and L1. This artery supplies a very large proportion of blood to the anterior spinal artery in the lumbosacral part of the cord, and therefore cannot be compensated for. Compression of this artery results in anterior spinal cord syndrome that can affect leg movement and bladder and bowel continence. Note that because the anterior portion of the spinal cord is specifically affected, sensory function is generally spared. Generally speaking, the cervical region of the cord receives its blood from branches stemming off the vertebral arteries, the thoracic region from branches off the posterior intercostals, and the lumbosacral region from branches off the lumbar arteries. Branches from the lateral sacral artery supply the cauda equina. Drainage of blood from the spinal cord occurs through one of six of vertical veins along the spinal cord. Drainage then continues into anterior and posterior venous plexuses found embedded in the epidural fat. From here, blood drains back to the vena cava through segmental spinal veins that accompany the spinal nerves through the intervertebral foramen, similar to the segmental spinal arteries. That concludes our lesson on the spinal cord. Our next lesson is focused upon the shoulder region as we make our way into the upper appendage. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.